and joking too. Sipping and roasting is what we do. Light them up, drink them down. With the cigars all around. Welcome, my friends, to this fine little radio program called Smoking and Toasting. It's all about craft beer, fine spirits, and hand rolled cigars. Uh, we are in the studio for show number 141, uh, and we have a, a special guest on the show today. Dave, it's Mitten, right? Is mitten. how you say it. Like the Mitten. Like the Mitten. Oh, like the differently. Dave is a global brand ambassador for Canadian whiskey. Uh, I mean, for, from Cor- from Corby Branch. Yeah, you gotta love that as a job. It's it sounds pretty made up. Like yeah, it does. It totally, to, it totally to, does. When you're going through uh, crossing borders, you're going through customs yeah. at airports, and someone asks <laughs> what you do, you have to pause for a minute and say this is actually true, and maybe yeah, show and them then your they cards. go, no, really, what yeah. do you really do? Yeah, I get it. I totally get it. <laughs> well, uh, so we're going to talk Canadian whiskey on the show today, and this will be the first time we've ever done, we've had Canadian whiskey on the show, oh, great. but this will be the first time we've ever done a show that deals with it, you know, a little more in depth, so uh, so excited about that. Uh, we are brought to you by B&B Butchers and Restaurant at 1814 Washington Ave in Houston, in the shops at Clear Fork in Fort Worth, BB Italia on Memorial in Houston, and BB Lemon on Washington Ave, and a brand new location coming soon. So uh, the BB Empire is expanding. Uh, it's which becoming is, a that, real thing. That's a good thing. And you know what I think it is? <clears throat> I think Jeremiah just needs more places to drink. That's what, that's what I think <laughs> it is. That's what I think it is. I don't get to is. drink on yeah. this side of town. Uh, and, and he is a fun guy to hang out and drink with, so we'll do that again uh, uh, very soon. Dave Mitten is our uh, special guest this week, but we do want to take a moment and say special thanks uh, to our guests uh, from last week, Brandon Luna with McAuliffe uh, Cigars, uh, Jenny Lynn Hunter with Drew Estate, and Alan Denny with E.P. Carrillo. Alan, of course, he just pops up everywhere. Yeah, who nobody and cares he's about, totally so. ahead of Chris yeah. Hart now. Uh, yes, he is. So that that should be uh, that should be interesting to watch how that plays out. I think Chris Hart has been traveling, so I don't I don't know if he's been able to to keep up. You know, I totally with, expect him to pie with Chris whether or anytime. not he's behind on on appearances. <laughs> but uh, uh, something to look forward to. Uh, so we'll be tasting some uh, Canadian whiskeys from the Corby line uh, today, and we're looking forward to that. We also have. A uh, couple of really interesting beers, I think, uh, Ian. Uh, our friends at No Label, I say our friends, I don't really know anyone there. I just think of them as my friends because of their beers are very friendly. The fact that they have friendly beers, that's right. Uh, no Label in Katy, Texas, they have released a uh, Mojito Lime Goza. And so I like mojitos. I like goza. This this it, seems like an easy. I would an easy say fit, that that right? sounds like a terrible beer until you say goza, and then you think, okay, I can see mojito line yeah, going yeah. with that style of well, beer. I mean, we'll see. That I think it's going to be a challenge, right. to be honest with you, well, to bring I, those flavors together. But goza's already a little bit sour. Yes, so. yes, and I do like that. Uh, Bear Bottle Brew Company uh, from San Francisco. Uh, has released an IPA called Secret Path to Paradise. I am down with this path, and we'll be tasting that on the show <laughs> as well. Uh, also, uh, as if as wonderful and flowery as that sounds, then we have Smog City Brewing uh, with their Infinite Wishes bourbon barrel-aged Imper- Imperial Stout. So those will be our, uh, our beers we'll be checking out That today. sounds good so, to me. Yeah, yeah, very good. So um, what else? Um, we've got... Uh, all kinds of things going on in the news. Uh, depending on what we have time to get to, um, we'll share this with you. But one of these for our listeners and, and viewers who are in Texas, um, uh, beer to go is just about uh, law now in Texas. Uh, it was passed unanimously in the Texas Senate. Beer to go means that breweries and brew pubs will be able to sell you six packs, crawlers, growlers on your way out. That's awesome. Currently, only brew pubs can do that, but not breweries themselves. It depends on the classification, which has a lot to do with how many uh, barrels they produce, and you know all the all these other things. So, um, so anyway, it's it's a good thing for breweries and brew pubs. It's a good thing for craft beer. Yes. Maybe not so much for you know brick and mortar retailers who are worried they are going to lose sales 
because of this. But this is already legal in almost every state in the country, yeah. and it does not seem to have had negative impact on sales at your local, you know, your, your you know your local uh, beer shop or or. Well, yeah, know, because if you if you're closer, whatever, so. well, here's the deal: if that's the beer you want, and you're closer to the brewery. You just go by the brewery and get the beer. That's a nice thing, right? But most people aren't that close to a brewery, so most people are still going to buy their beers at the HEB, or they're going to buy their beer at the you know grocery store, at, at the local liquor store, or wherever here. What I like about it is that sometimes you'll go to the brewery, you'll be there, um, you know, just for the evening with friends, or you've gone to get something to eat or whatever, and you taste something that isn't available in stores, mm-hmm. and you you're like, this is really, yeah, I really good. Take that home. I would love to be able to take some of this home, and it'll be a lot easier. Well, to Well, this do will that allow now, breweries so. to do more of those kind of things as well. That's absolutely right. Uh, because mm-hmm. because now they have an outlet for it instead of hey, we we can make a bigger batch of this because you can sure. take it home. That's versus right. We only did you know so many kegs mm-hmm. of this because we can only sell it. Speaking here. of which, I, I'm bummed because my. Like one of my favorite IPAs in the world, I think was a seasonal for Odell's, and I think it's all gone now. Aww. And that was the uh, uh, the what was it? The mule picker? What was it? The, uh, the yeah. hot picker? Tree shaker. What is it? Tree shaker. No, it's not the tree shaker. That one's still around. It's the wolf picker. Wolf picker. Thank you. The wolf picker IPA from Odell, which we had on the show and. Man, I, it was one of those things where every time I would see it, I would buy it. Suddenly, it's no longer on the shelf. Adele's a great brewery. I, you they know, really one of my are. mainstays and is it, their it was, 90 shilling. That, that's 90 such shilling a shilling is Scotch wonderful. Ale. It's wonderful. Yes, absolutely. So, anyway, so uh, if you happen to see Wolf Picker still around anywhere, let me know because I'll. I'll drive over and, <laughs> Rush and, over and, 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 and snag it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it's been an interesting week. Maxim Magazine has named uh, 10 great cigars to smoke right now. And Thrillist uh, has put together a list of 21 beers you need to be drinking this summer. So we'll, uh, we'll have some lists to, uh, to, to go through. So uh, it's going to be, uh, I think, a, a really fun and interesting show. And I'm really excited about, uh, about Canadian whiskey. I feel like Canadian whiskey maybe doesn't get some of the recognition that it deserves in the U.S. It's not really thought of maybe the same way as American whiskeys or or uh, you know whiskeys from the U.K. Well, so, and it gets it gets beat up in the stores <coughs> here Japan, too because yeah. we have a whole section of Texas whiskey now. Right, right, of course, and which that, means Canadian whiskey gets shoved into one little corner. Right, and of the and, aisle. and that may or may not be fair. So we'll do. We'll do some tasting and, and, and see how we weigh in on this. <laughs> That's right. Uh, so it's been a, a crazy week for me, and I assume for you as well, Ian. But did you have an opportunity to smoke anything interesting this So week? crazy week. You know, I, I'm on I'm on school schedule right now, so I had most of the week off. Oh, So it hasn't been that crazy. I've been enjoying myself a little uh, bit. Good. And well, I would imagine maybe... i got to be working next week, but you know how it is. <laughs> I would imagine maybe you had a... Uh, a time for a, a, a few more cigars than normal. Huh? I did. I actually got up uh, early today. I don't know what happened to me. It was very <laughs> strange. So I had time to smoke a cigar over at uh, Casa de Monte Cristo. That was a lot of fun. I picked out a uh, uh, Caldwell cigar, one that I think you may or may not have uh, uh, reviewed on the show at some point in time. It's called The Tea. The Tea, Which was yes. originally called The Truth, but then uh, mm-hmm. they had an issue. had to change the name, so now it's just The Tea. Mm-hmm. This was a collaboration with Matt Booth, Caldwell, and A.J. Fernandez. A three-way, uh, a three-way, a three-way blending, yes. And I will tell you, uh, they uh, they formed like Voltron. It was a delicious cigar. <laughs> this is a 5x54 uh, Robusto box press. Uh, it's a Nicaraguan Puro, meaning uh, all the, the wrapper, binder, and filler are all Nicaraguan. It's a Habano wrapper. The appearance on this wrapper was very dark chocolate, very firm and uniform all the way across, smooth cigar. Overall, the pre-light sniff on this. I didn't pick up a lot on the pre-light sniff. I got uh, coffee, leather, and hay Mm -hmm. uh, a little bit going on there. Uh, The pre-light draw, I used a punch. Uh, It had about a medium draw on it, not enough to make me concerned that it was going to be too tight or anything like that, but not not effortless. Mm -hmm. Um, And I got a lot of leather and barnyard kind of flavors from from the pre-light draw. The initial light, uh, pepper, a little bit of sawdust, you know, like uh, wood kind of flavors, Mm -hmm. uh, not certainly in any kind of bad way. Uh, Leather, uh, nuttiness, like a cashew kind of sweetness right off the front, and a little tangy, fruity kind of flavor going on Mm -hmm. in the background was really nice. The first third of this cigar, sweet, nutty, and fruity, like right off the bat, it just developed into this really sweet cigar. Um, Pepper was a little there, a little bitter, bitter chocolate in the background, coffee, especially on the retrohale. Um, had a perfect burn, solid ash. Uh, the second third of this cigar, chocolate, nutty. The uh, the the t- 
tangy, fruity stuff kind of backed off for the second third of this cigar. Um, leather and coffee were there. A little bit of light pepper was there the whole time. It was, uh, again, a perfect burn, solid ash. I really liked the way this cigar developed. The sweet, fruity, and nutty flavors came right back for the last third of this. Like mm. They cycled all the way out and then came back in. And the chocolate uh, came up a whole lot more. There was a little more oaky kind of flavor. Um, and coffee. This it's, really sounds pretty amazing. It was a great cigar. Yeah. It was a. Uh, I don't mean to give away the uh, PVQ or anything, but uh, it had a perfect burn, solid ash. I smoked it way, way down until uh, it was tiny. Uh, I gave it a six on the price versus quality at an eleven dollars cigar. It was not a so, cheap cigar. Yeah, so a six is but, a great rating. But I that. would have been happy with this paying even a couple dollars more. I'd have been like, you know, at this price point, it's a great cigar. So mm-hmm. I enjoyed the. Uh, I enjoyed the whole uh, event of that cigar. It was, it was Price fantastic. to quality, Dave, is something we do on the show, mostly with cigars. We'll occasionally do it with other things, uh, where we basically say, on a scale of 1 to 10, if you got exactly what you paid for, if that's how you perceived what it was you were, you were sampling, that's a 5. Oh, so okay. anything that rates above a 5 means I wouldn't have been disappointed if this had been... Even even if I paid even more for this, right. based on what it was. So you're saying at an eleven dollar cigar, even if you paid like thirteen for I, it, I'd have been perfectly. You happy still would have been that. perfectly yeah. happy. So that's a. It's much harder for expensive cigars to get above a five, right? Uh, than it is for sometimes you smoke something cheaper. Like last week, I was talking about a really cheap cigar. But it was like, you know, it was. You know, two dollars and twenty five cents. It, it was way better than that, so it was easier for that to get a six or a seven uh, than for an eleven dollar cigar. So anyway, I always like to point that out because, again, right, if I'm going to drop eleven bucks for a cigar, which I'm not afraid to do, but I want to make sure I'm yeah. not missing the boat on it. You know yeah, what I mean? And, and you know, at eleven bucks a pop, that's not insubstantial. And no, you know, I don't, I don't know who you work for, but you know, my boss, <laughs> you know, an eleven dollar cigar. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to ask, what do you normally like? I, I get it in the evenings. You're having a nice cigar. You're having it with a, a Cuban <coughs> rum. You're having it with a cognac, a nice whiskey in the mornings when you're having a cigar like today. Do you have a nice coffee? Yeah. You go to your cigars go coffee great house. Great with coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Cigars nice. go. As a matter of fact, I had mine with tea this morning. Oh, with tea. Nice. Quite good. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That totally works. So. And I'll just mention sometimes a cigar and a diet Dr Pepper is a match made in heaven. Yeah, yeah. You, so you just never know. There so, you go. Um, I should start uh, uh, as as we do uh, every week on our uh, when we talk about the cigars that we've had this week. I should start on mine by mentioning uh, because my cigar was a Gran Habano Blue and Green Gran Robusto, and I should begin by mentioning I'm not a huge fan of Gran Habano's main line. Uh, of cigars. I used to buy them a lot because they were relatively inexpensive. Yeah. So you could get several more cigars for the same amount of money. And it wasn't that they weren't good, but they had this one particular flavor. It was kind of a grassy flavor to it. It just really wasn't to my palate. Now, I know a, a lot of people who love those cigars, both for the price and and they like they like that flavor just for me, for my palate. You know, cuz you know how that is. Sometimes I, what I works for me doesn't work for yeah, you. Well, no, yeah, I totally get that. I mean, that. they generally are well constructed and the other flavors are are very good. It's just that one particular flavor just isn't my favorite thing. So I I kind of got away from smoking them as much as I found other cigars in that same lower price range that I liked that didn't have that, and so I, I, I stopped doing this. So I'll mention that before I tell you about um, the blue and green line, which is new, and it's pricier, so it's not in that same sort of, uh, you know, 3 $4 a cigar that sometimes right, the, right. the Grand Habano uh, main, uh, per, main line can be. It is wrapped in a Connecticut wrapper, which I think pretty much all of the main line of Grand Habanos are Connecticut. They're not huge, powerful cigars. They're they're definitely milder. Uh, but this one is a Connecticut wrapper with Nicaraguan binder and filler. And the whole length of this cigar was wrapped in a cedar tube. So a very different kind of a presentation. Yeah, a little more Grand elegant Habano. there. Yeah. Yes, and they were using this sort of, uh, there's a little bit of cloth uh, around the top mm-hmm. and the bottom of the uh, of the cedar tube, and uh, it was kind of a purple cloth with uh, with sort of a gold colored specks mm-hmm. on. It. So it looked it actually looked a lot like uh, what is, is it is it Jim Beam that comes in that blue 
uh, in the bag, bag Crown Royal. A Crown. I'm sorry. Why was I thinking Jim Beam? Um, uh, it looked a little bit you like a Crown Royal. Obviously, never played Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, Kurt, I, I wasn't. I wasn't a big dean. I was always playing the sci-fi games. So, uh, so you can have the dragons. I'll take for the any aliens. of you out, out there that are clueless. It comes in a little drawstring bag, yeah, and that's yeah. what you keep your dice in. Right, and and you know, I'm I'm much more into the. You can have the dragons. I'll take the aliens. I, you know, that's, I never uh, aliens very, and zombies. Very very rarely play them myself, but I have many friends who aliens you know. and zombies for me. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm I'm certainly a bigger geek, but uh, uh, but what is it you always say? Uh, that you're you're a geek, but you're uh, I'm just a geek about super cool things. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly right. So, yeah. uh, so the cigar uh, it was wrapped in a cedar tube, pulled the tube off it. There were nice flavors on the pre light. It was a uh, kind of a mellow tobacco note, some hay cedar. I used a V cut, lit it up, and the first thing that I noticed about it was that it was quite a bit more powerful than the Grand Habanos that I was used to, even though it had the Connecticut wrapper. So it's a little deceptive because usually when you see that lighter color wrapper, you're thinking it's Likely to be a right, milder right, right, smoke, right. Milder. Um, uh, but there was a very pleasant earthiness uh, to the cigar. It was creamy uh, with some punch, um, notes of black pepper, uh, a little bit of breadiness to it. A really very enjoyable mix of flavors. The construction wasn't bad, but the burn was uneven. It did need tending several times as I smoked it, but. It wasn't a perfect burn, but it was not something that kept me from enjoying the cigar, enjoying the flavors. It just, I don't mind touching a cigar up as long as it's not driving me crazy and right. flaking all over the place. So, um, so I was surprised to find it to be just a little north of medium bodied when it was all said and done. Uh, but the happiest surprise was none of that grassy flavor that was not to my liking on the. Uh, on the other line. Um, so all in all, I really, really enjoyed the cigar. It's a nine dollar stick. Um, I'm going to give it a solid five. Um, I think if if it were, um, I didn't remember how much I had paid for it. It's been in the humidor for a little while. Mm-hmm. Uh, if if it were uh, a seven dollar cigar, I'd have probably gone a, a bit bigger in in the number. Uh, but when I found because I was thinking it was like a seven eight, when I found out it was nine, I was like, well, you know what? It's worth nine. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I'd necessarily. Feel the same way if I it's paid ten or eleven nine, for right, it. Right. So it's so it's fair at nine. So the Grand Habano blue in green smokes a little, uh, uh, you know, a little unevenly down down the stretch, but very very good flavor. So uh, so I recommend it. That's uh, that's where we'll send you this week. So um, all right, I tell you what, let's do. Let's take a break because I want to get started talking and tasting uh, Canadian whiskey, and we have some beers to taste too, and I want to find out how um, <clears throat> how my guidance counselor could possibly have missed the potential career path of global Canadian I'm, I'm whiskey a little brand angry ambassador. About that too. And I want to I want to see what we can do to prevent this wrong from happening again uh, in the Future lives of young and impressionable kids that are out there that are trying to figure out what to do with the rest of their life. Uh, so we'll take a quick break and we will be right back. You are listening to Smoking and Toasting and we're on show number 141 and we'll be right back. Yeah, I feel like like my oversight on that is that any time I had this guy, I thought, I'll drink this whiskey, not I'll sell this whiskey. Welcome back. It's Smoking and Toasting, show number 100. And 41. Our program is brought to you by B&B Butchers and Restaurant at 1814 Washington Ave in Houston and in the shops at Clear Fork in Fort Worth. Uh, in both locations, they make bacon that will change your life. So the the fact that they're branching out and making uh, mm-hmm. different restaurants, I, I, I don't know. I haven't been to the Italian restaurant, but I yes. hope that they have the bacon there. I know that's not traditional Italian well, fare, but, okay, so, but it's so good. But if you think about it, there is like a, um, a spaghetti carbonara would have... Uh, yeah. Would have bacon in it, so there's there's some call for bacon in the Italian cuisines, right? I, you know, we'd have to look up the menu and see. Yeah, well, because um, bringing or, that bacon to the rest of this, or we could just plan baconless world to go. Yeah, yeah, there's we that. Should do that. Yeah, we if should you guys, totally if you've never had on research, so yeah. the bacon mm-hmm. comes out and it's like this thick, and it's and at first you're like, well, this is not the kind of bacon I like. I like 
you know, thin crispy bacon, <laughs> it's and so then good. you take your first oh, bite. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh my it's god! Covered with blue cheese and truffle uh, oil. And it's uh, it's, it's amazing. Terrible. It's yeah. like I didn't know. I, I didn't know they need to make a thing called "I didn't know it was bacon." <laughs> 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 I can't believe it's not. I can't believe it's not bacon, or it is bacon. Anyway, uh, so welcome back to the show. Our uh, guest is Dave Mitten. Dave is. The uh, global brand ambassador from Corby Brands, but specific, you deal specifically with Canadian whiskey. Is that right? Yeah. For the uh, last five years, I've been looking after all of their Canadian whiskeys. Uh, I am there if there is another Canadian brand that we might have in another market, whether mm-hmm. it be something like Ungava Gin, which is a very popular Canadian gin, or if it was one of their rums. But 99% of the time, I look after the Canadian whiskey. So are you Canadian uh, originally? Were you born in Canada? Born and raised. And what part? East Coast. East uh, Coast, really? New Brunswick, kind of uh. by Nova Scotia. If anyone's not familiar with Canadian geography, right by Maine and Vermont. May I just take a moment to compliment you on your oysters? Oh, well, thank you. Because they're that, wonderful. That cold Atlantic water. <laughs> oh, man. Some of the good. best seafood in the world. Yeah, I, you know, yeah. living uh, here in Texas has its its pleasures. Tex-Mex comes to mind. But I do the not Gulf Coast eat. shrimp is particularly awesome. The shrimp is okay, but I do not eat oysters that came out of that warm <laughs> Gulf water. Oh, no. That's a good way to get sick. But those cold water oysters. Oh, yeah. And it almost feels like the further north you go, the colder the water gets, the tastier the oysters can be. Yep. But, uh, yeah, you head up north to Newfoundland. Yeah, and, you know, and it's in between Iceland and us, and it's, mm-hmm. it's beautiful water. Yeah, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, well, so so you were Canadian, born and raised, and are you? Or do you live in Canada now, or you uh, live here in the states because of your duties? Yeah, well, I, I joke. I pay rent in Toronto. <laughs> okay, gotcha. I pay that good old Toronto rent. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm not there very often. I travel. I travel a lot. I mean, I, it's it's been 54 flights since january 8th yeah so it's 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 constant travel we had uh before he passed away we had uh, dave uh pickerel from um uh, uh Whistlepig, from yeah. Whistlepig on the show and he told us he just he finally just sold his house because he was on the road so much that he actually yeah. didn't have an actual domestic domicile or whatever you call it that's like a, that's a weird kind of homeless it, it, it really is <laughs> you're, you're staying in nice hotels and, right. and going around the world you know talking about your whiskey and uh, uh and yet and i guess there's a p.o box somewhere where his uh where his mail would go to but I, i've had that discussion but it is just that like those few days a month you are home when you get to actually it's be nice to unlock your home. door yeah. and be like that is my sofa that is my Mm-hmm. Bed, like, yeah, I'm I get alone. It. Totally get it. You just don't want to be in a hotel room again, <laughs> right? I totally get that. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so, I guess the biggest question that we would have to ask any global brand ambassador is, how in the hell did you get that job? Yeah, it sounds pretty made up. Um, I guess my background, uh, as I say, I grew up in small town Canada, East Coast, and I decided I didn't want to do the university thing. And told my parents I was going to go see the world. They said, that sounds like a fantastic idea. I hope you've got enough money to do it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Yep, yep. <laughs> and uh, I set sail, essentially, and I did. I went backpacking wow. for years, and I had to pay my way, and mm-hmm. found myself in the bar and restaurant industry. Uh, worked from nightclubs to saloons, from Australia to Los Angeles and everywhere no kidding, really, for that, years. That far flung, though. Yeah, like wow. I just, I did. I wanted to see the world. Uh, and it was, you know, cheap cheap flights as you could find. And, and sure. you know, as my parents said, they're like, do it while you're 18 to right. 24. Yeah. That's yeah. absolutely When you can sleep right. on a floor somewhere because you don't yeah. want to do that in your right. 40s. Right, you don't want to do it in your 40s. You certainly don't want to do it once you have family responsibilities. Exactly. And, you know, it's, it's, it's totally the way to go. Um, quick sidebar, working in bars in so many different locations, like are the bars in, let's say, Australia, for example, are they just the same as the ones in the U.S. or Canada, or, or are there uh, uh, obviously other than the accents and things yeah. and the products that are available? But like the whole vibe is it, the is same it different? Bar personalities yeah, and G- generally, yeah, generally vibes are the same. You'll you'll find a, a, a you'll find a, a norm at every bar you go to almost. <laughs> That's uh, wonderful. But I mean, yeah, it's different different cultures so i mean there'll be different cocktail crazes or beer crazes or spirit crazes that's for sure there's a difference there i I know if you think like an irish pub for example uh, it has its own sort of vibe to it that's different from say a corner bar in the united states 
Unless it's or an ice house, uh, yeah, right, or an ice house, right? And so I was just wondering, are there are there things like that that might be unique to, you know, the bars in Australia or, or different places like that? So well, I mean, when it comes to, I, I worked at an Irish bar in Cairns, Australia, for a while, <laughs> and I'm like, that's a, that's the beauty of Irish bars. Any town, right, in any right, country in the world, if you need to go find an Irish bar, you can, and, and all they're always them, busy. Yeah, and all of them imported their main bar from Ireland, or so they say. You know, remember, yeah. is that always true? Like they always go, yes, this came from the so-and-so pub in Ireland. Yeah, okay. How many pubs in Ireland still have bars at this right, point? Right, because right. Yeah, they've, they've shipped them out all I'll, over the place. I'll so. tell you one thing that was different with Australia was it was uh, not a big tipping policy, but it was the wage, the salary. So you made more money you but made less a, in tips. I made over $20 an hour bartending. Wow. And you didn't really make tips. And then I smartened up six months into it and said, I'm going to go work at a tourist bar. Where the tourists where all don't Americans know. and Canadians <laughs> coming in and they tip. So oh, it's like, tips. you yeah. still wouldn't make it much, but you'd make enough to pay for your yeah. food the have next day, extra, your, your hostel extra. room. Fold um, the money, yeah. But it was uh, a lot of the owners would say, we love hiring Canadians and Americans mm-hmm. because you guys, it's bred into you. You hustle mm-hmm. for tips, even yeah. though you're not making tips. Even you you work, <laughs> you work fast. So. That was that was also back in the '90s, <laughs> aging myself. So it was so, a different times. So at a certain point, you got uh, onto the uh, got into the um, representation side of the spirits yeah. industry. Right? Well, I, I ended up coming back to Canada, and I moved to Toronto. I went to see some friends. Mm-hmm. Literally, was going to be passing through. Uh, started taking some courses. Found myself settling in. A friend convinced me, "Let's open a bar." Said, <laughs> oh, yeah. My, it always seems like a good idea at the time. Yes, 24, I'd love to be it. rich. Let's yeah. open a bar. <laughs> <laughs> I, I learned a long time ago that this lifelong dream that I've had to open a bar really has nothing to do with wanting to be in the bar industry. What I learned was that all I really wanted to do was to be able to walk in the front door and go, drinks for everyone. <laughs> And I could do that and actually pay for it out of my pocket a lot cheaper than I could actually own a bar. Yeah, that's, so, that's for sure. So that's uh, so every now and then it it may happen. <laughs> but it was bar a- bar patrons be warned. I may walk in the front door and it's, you got to take that moment to look around and see how many people are in the bar first. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you want to do a little bar. You don't want to do some nightclub <laughs> yeah. where it's bottle service that's only. Right. Oh no! I, did, I just realized Beyonce and Jay Z are here. I'm screwed. Um, <laughs> So, so you got to, you you got a chance to open a bar. How did it go? First one, I opened. I ended up opening five different bars. No kidding. Now. So they uh, must have done pretty well, or you wouldn't have kept going, right? How, how For, long did it take you to learn not to stick your finger in fire? <laughs> <laughs> that was way before I owned bars and restaurants, but that was a couple times. Um, you know what? The first one's interesting. Like I've done podcasts with people interviewing me just on that first bar because it was there's a whole story to that. And was it in Toronto, right? It was in Toronto. It was an old butcher shop from 1923, three levels that had been shut down for decades. And we ended up getting the space and we were two guys in our early 20s not knowing what we were getting into. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had to rebuild four floors of it. It took us two and a half years. Wow. Cocktails were not really a thing yet, except New York City and London, UK. We wanted to try cocktails. Uh, <laughs> city was not ready yeah. for it. We did a different food. We did something ridiculous in 2004. We decided to sell local beer and oh. local wine. Wow. And do local spirits when everyone would come in and go, what is your goddamn problem? <laughs> <laughs> this stuff is not cheap. And, it, now, you know, and it's like, now you'd be a hero. Yeah, you know, a hero of the scene. It but was, uh, but you're right. Back then, it, that was unusual. It was yeah, it very absolutely unusual. was. Classic cocktails. Guys would walk in and go, "I'll, I'll have one of those Manhattans," and they'd send it back. Like, is there a problem? Like it's just it's straight booze. <laughs> That's like, yeah, a Manhattan. You, 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 you've read the, the description. Never mind. So yeah. <laughs> here's a Stolian raspberry with some soda. <laughs> um, <laughs> learned a lot from that. We made a bit of a name for ourselves. Mm-hmm, we mm-hmm. got some great accolades. Uh, that got put on a list as one of the top five bars in the world from a place in England, which was really cool. That is awesome. But what I learned was publicity does not pay your bills. Right. I lost ah. my lost my shirt on it, lost some mm-hmm. family money on it I had to pay back. Uh, financially kind of crippled us a little bit, but we were young enough to come back, mm-hmm. did a couple other little spots, ended up doing one place called the Harvard Room, 
where that was kind of our baby. It got some great accolades, ran nice. it for 10 years. And the story with that is I ended up selling enough of these particular whiskeys there mm -hmm. that the company came to me at one point and said, so what are you, what are you doing? We, we noticed <laughs> you're, you're, you're selling more of this than really anyone else in Canada anyone right ever. now. That's interesting. Um, yeah. How do you feel about going on the road with it? And essentially kind of started off as a part-time gig with them and my two business partners at the restaurant. I'm like, sounds like a great opportunity to get out and see the world a little bit and say hi to people and introduce them. And at that time, I still had the restaurant, so it was cross-pollination. Right. Oh, if you come to Toronto, come see my place. Come right, do this. Right, and it right. was always... So were you selling a lot of those particular products because you were selling a lot of everything? Or was there a reason those were, you know, were so big at your bar? I was selling a lot of everything. And we were quite a large, we were a small space, but we were pretty... I think did, did I'd safe to say well respected cocktail bar in mm -hmm. Toronto. Yeah, did a big bunch. Toronto is a big city. Yeah. I think there's close to eight million people there, and it's like you know we 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 were lucky. We, the seats were full. Mm -hmm. um, very fortunate. Uh, had a great staff there. Uh, I loved all spirits. I loved all whiskeys. An equal I, opportunity spirit lover. I I did have a thing for Canadian whiskeys, and you got to think of it this way. It's like going to Australia. Australian wine doesn't have the greatest. Uh, people don't view Australian wine the same way they view the same way they view France, France or, or Italy, or California. Now, when you're in yeah. Australia and you go to the vineyards and you taste and you have some of the wines that are not available outside of Australia. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Canada. You're in there, and I'm tr I'm getting to play with Canadian whiskeys that are not available outside mm -hmm. of Canada at mm -hmm. this point, and mm -hmm. I'm loving them. Yeah, that's I great. love my American whiskeys. I loved. I sold many bourbons and American mm -hmm. ryes on the back bar and our cocktails. But particularly, some of these are very unique to Canadian whiskey. So where should we start uh, in terms of tasting? I'd say you'd start with the Pike Creek. With the Pike Creek. It's our so. lightest style. Um, uh, would you like to affix this to our uh, Mr. Thingamajiggy or whatever you go? Oh, oh, it's manual today. I didn't realize that. <laughs> uh, we, we had some camera placement issues, I think, today. So... Uh, so the Pike I think Creek we just ran out of cameras. Pike, just ran out of cameras. The Pike Creek. Tell us about this particular spirit. Put this away over here. Um, Pike Creek. So I mean, Canadian whiskey in itself, as you were saying before, it's a, it is a, it's a category. I kind of joke. It's in the U.S. It's almost like Canadians itself. Mm -hmm. it's like everyone knows it exists. No one knows a whole lot about it. <laughs> well, I, I think mean, most it, people can only name two Canadian whiskeys that's, anyway. There's two extremely popular brands that you can go to the East Islands of Thailand or New Zealand or all across Texas, that's for sure, and see them on any back bar. Mm -hmm. I, I can tell you that I'm already, you already are kind of speaking my language yeah. because um, this uh, whiskey was finished in rum barrels, and uh, I'm a big fan of rum and have discovered that some of my favorite whiskeys are those that are finished in rum barrels. Yep. Yes. Uh, so, so, I mean, uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, uh, to checking this out. Absolutely. I'll well, give you, you a little can, rundown on it. I mean, you can. De I'm, I'm doing research over mm -hmm. here already. Uh, yes. You can definitely taste that rum barrel influence on the back mm -hmm. end of this. It's very, very like uh, uh, cane sugar and banana influence there. And this is uh, just just so I under we understand everything correctly. This is available. People can find this in retail stores in the United States. Uh, this is not a difficult thing to find, or no. you don't have to go to Canada now to get this, correct? You this do have to stop and look at the Canadian whiskey section. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in at least in in most stores, that's how it's that's how it's uh, metered that's out, right? right? Absolutely. Yeah. This uh, is readily available, and like you say, it's a ten year old majority corn whiskey finished in rum casks. For under thirty dollars, correct? Mm -hmm. it, every state might be off a dollar or two, but mm -hmm. it's under thirty dollars. Wow, it's pretty good. It, it is super tasty. This has just got loads of those um, those oak and uh, sort of vanilla and and uh, 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 kind of rich rum flavors on the finish, but it's still very much a whiskey. It still oh, feels like a whiskey going down. It's still got that that whiskey uh, corn flavor uh, up front. Ian, help me out here. How am I doing? Oh, it's, this is this is pretty solid right here. It's mm -hmm. the uh, the flavors like this right here has a, a sweetness that's not too sticky. It's not a lingering right. sweetness. Correct. It actually goes down pretty clean. Uh, pretty clean leaves a uh, a little more uh, mineral 
uh, water kind of mm-hmm. aftertaste, and then the retro hail has a whole bunch of that oakiness going on, which is really well, nice. Tip of your tongue, it's like say majority corn, so you get that soft sweetness. You get a, there's a little bit of rye blended into it, so mm-hmm. you get that spice on the back, a little bit of heat. But for me, I mean, I get the Christmas cake, the mm-hmm. little bit of molasses, like that mm-hmm. rich yeah. carrot, right? That molasses, spice. yes, for sure, for sure. Um, I'm, that was yeah, that was the thing that hit me first was that cane sugar kind of molasses kind of thing. I was reading from the uh, um, from the label here that it is um, this, it's aged in uh, non-temperature controlled uh, rooms when yeah. it's in the cast. What it, What is the advantage of that? It's Well, I mean first off, it's pretty unique. It was one thing when I started working with the distillery. One thing that drove me nuts when I started working with them. Mm-hmm. They were like, how do you, you know, I went down to learn to make the whiskey for a week with our master blender and I said, what do you think? At the end, I said, this is incredible. And I'm I'm kind of pissed off. <laughs> and they're like, why? And I said, I, I've been buying your damn whiskeys for almost 20 years. And this is an hour flight from Toronto. And, right. and my, the point of mine going on was I said, we're not educating people right. on this category mm-hmm. or these brands. Like, how do I not know all of this stuff? So that's been our main focus the last five years is complete education. And like, that's really the primary thing that a brand ambassador does, right? Yeah. Is is educate in, in people educate, about the brand. engagement, and advocacy. Wow. I, I mean, it. it's the soft sell. <laughs> I love uh, it. <laughs> I uh, love it. But the warehouses, so where we're located is Windsor, Ontario, most mm-hmm. southern tip of Canada, right mm-hmm. across from Detroit. We take Ubers to Detroit. From the distillery that's is how cool. close it is. <laughs> that's cool. Um, so great history of Hiram Walker Distillery and mm-hmm. the city of Detroit over the years. Where our warehouses are situated, we have 16 warehouses, 1.6 million barrels of whiskey laying down. Oh, wow. And that part of town is called Pike Creek. So, and that's so, the name so of the whiskey. Pike right. Creek is a whiskey, the story of maturation. For instance, during the summer months in another few weeks... It's non-temperature controlled warehouses, as you say, mm-hmm. will be as hot as Louisville, Kentucky. Okay, so you temperatures get that, rise, yeah, and you it get is that, humid. That kind of uh, of vibe or temperature or distillation um, uh, atmosphere, I guess, Absolutely. is the way to say. And I mean, the that barrels you get for a, a Tennessee whiskey. The barrels are they're expanding. Yeah, big time. It is so warm inside of there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, it's a few hundred thousand barrels in each warehouse, enough alcohol going through that if we were to show up and just open the door and you said, I'm going to walk to the other side, I'm like, you won't make it. <laughs> <laughs> That's you, wild. You, you'll, you'll be, you'll yeah. pass out and be fixated and, you know, yeah. we'd, wow. we'd have to drag you out before it got worse. But uh, it's pretty incredible. I sense a new Olympic event, by the way. <laughs> right? <laughs> Challenge accepted. Yeah. I love it. Uh, but then it's the opposite, because we're still in Canada, and that part of the world, it's right so it's in the Great Lakes. So it's going to get pretty cold in the, uh, uh, the wintertime, right? It goes to the opposite, where it's like, in Celsius, it's 40 degrees in the summer, and then in the winter, it goes to minus 40, mm. which is the only time Celsius and Fahrenheit meet up. Right. So that's still minus 40 Fahrenheit. Yeah. Everything in those warehouses just frees up completely tight, like frost over top of the barrels. Mm-hmm. Everything except the whiskey freezes. Right, right. right. So that really slows down the aging process. Sure. But it's only a few months, and it's, they say, and I can't tell you anywhere else where it would get that cold, but yet that hot for aging in the world. Not even different parts of Canada where there are other large distilleries, you'd have that, it stays that colder. Swing. Right. You don't right. get yeah. that heat. So it is quite unique. That is interesting. Um, uh, you speaking of aging, I also noticed on the bottle that it's, uh, it's it says 10-year-old, which means the youngest the youngest whiskey in here is ten years that old. That is that is a Canadian rule for something that is, what did you say, a thirty dollar and under price point uh, to be ten year aged. I, I think it's pretty remarkable, actually. You know, well, this is one I've got to get that I, everywhere. I got a buddy who's a rum aficionado. I mean, he doesn't really drink whiskey, but this is, as you can imagine, this is one that he does. This is one that he likes. Right. Sure, yeah. And he's he's like, this is my this is my cigar whiskey. I'm like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, Out of I all the different that. scotches you could totally, choose, yep, but he totally, this is yes. his, no like because the well. the flavor profile would really support uh, a good even a medium bodied uh, uh, cigar, I think, yeah. uh, and wouldn't wouldn't obliterate it. Would complement it uh, reasonably well. It, it's a great introductory whiskey to someone who might not be into whiskeys, or if you've mm-hmm. got someone who loves right. rum or cognacs, right. this is a great way to. 
yeah, get them into. Me it. being a, a fan of rum, I instantly loved this because yeah. it had, you know, the, the really recognizable flavor profile on the finish. So. Well, and that big temperature swing you're talking about when you're uh, aging in the barrels, that just imparts a lot of that barrel into the whiskey. Yeah. We get, oh, a big, we get a big we get a big temperature swing here in Houston, Texas as well. We can go from let's say uh, 105 f- well, we can go from 40 degrees to like 104 degrees. So that's, right. uh, that's that's our temperature swing. It's a big swing. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a big uh, it's a big it difference. can do that in a day by the way. In the summertime, however, <laughs> we often are looking for very sessionable and um, uh, drinkable beers and uh, by the way, we do only high tech sound effects on this show. I'm sure you've noticed <laughs> yes, because of the either, little sound effects. We machine. either use this very high tech <laughs> yes. dev- uh, device here, yeah, or, or we do them actual. Yes, yeah, which is a really unique way to do sound effects. So, uh, I just opened a can of uh, No Label Brewing's Mojito Lime Goza, and this is uh, I'm pretty sure brand new. I just uh, saw it for the first time, and I'm going to pour and pass. And I, I have to say, I'm I'm really curious about this because. I love like, mojitos. I love lime. I love gozas. Um, I'm just I'm this smells a little. I, I don't know if they're going to be able to pull it off. It or not. Smells a little minty. Yeah, it really does. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think as a matter of fact, like <laughs> I've never put a beer to my nose. That well, smelled minty. And, and of course, there's mint in a mojito. Uh, yes, this yes. this says on the can is tracing. Its origins back to Sir Francis Drake and a favorite of Hemingway, the mojito has long been associated with the heat. Mojito lime is our interpret uh, our interpretation brewed with spearmint and lime, so it's actually brewed with spearmint uh, for a nice, refreshing summer libation. No scurvy here. And uh, I'm I'm curious, uh, Ian. You've done some research, so what are your thoughts? This is incredibly unique. Yeah, like I bet. this is so different from any other beer. Uh, it's it's mojito. If you like mojito, you're gonna probably like this beer. Um, it's got kind of a. It doesn't look that thick, but it has a little bit thicker mouth. It has feel more to viscosity it. Yeah. than you would expect. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. It's it's so interesting. It does so many weird things. <laughs> like from the first sip, you taste that 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 mint and that uh, and that. Uh, that lime is so strong, and then you get the beer flavor right in the middle, and then as you. As the finish comes up, it cleans up pretty quick, but then leaves you with minty freshness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is a weird thing for beer. It's it's a little strange. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I'm on the fence right now. I, I am <laughs> I am a little bit too. I find that it's a beer. My initial reaction is it's something I would really love to taste. Not sure if it would be something I would drink. You know the the you know fact I mean? that it's a goza gives you that little bit of um, sour. In there, which I think kind of makes it acceptable in some well, ways. Well, if you think are generally they go apple or watermelon not, or or this is something not a like Bud that, Light right? lime. No, it's definitely you know, it's this, much better than that. Yeah, you can tell that this is a crafted experience here versus mm-hmm. people like to put this in our beer, so we're just going to put it in our beer for you. The lime actually tastes like real lime as yes. opposed to lime uh, like lemon floor, or floor or cleaner, <laughs> like uh, floor cleaner. Uh, pledge. Which is, uh, ple- lemon pledge, yes. <laughs> That's right. Um, I like it, Ian. I'm just not sure. Like, I don't think I could have several of these at a time, you know? Yeah, uh, agreed. I don't know that after the first can of this that I would reach for a second one, but it's definitely interesting. And I will tell you this. If you see it on the shelf, it's probably worth grabbing one to share like we're doing now and just talk about it. And just talk about it. Because it's fun and it's different. Well, and that's what I love. And, you know, no label. These guys have, uh, have, you know... They're fearless. They really have gone to the edges of wherever they wanted to go in terms of what they've made. So I salute them for doing this. 5.2%, by the way. So you could uh, you could put down a few of these if you wanted to. Um, what do you think? I agree. It's completely unique, very different. It's very authentic, though. It's the mm-hmm. first thing I yeah. thought. I'm like, there's nothing about this seems artificial. Great mouthfeel. I could see people crushing these on a hot summer day in a patio. I will say that sometimes we have found that when we do a segment where we're um, drinking a a spirit or whiskey and also a beer in the same segment, sometimes we have found some amazing combinations of things that really one brings out all kinds of interesting and awesome things in the other. This is not one of those times. (laughs) 
Nope, not at all. <laughs> this doesn't necessarily. These two don't necessarily complement each other, so you can <laughs> strike them off the great pairing list. But, uh, but I will say, yeah, I, I think I think everybody should try this, if for no other reason than to support No Label for doing something this creative and interesting. I and just cool. I love No Label for the fact that they're just so fearless. Yeah, absolutely. Like they will try anything, and they have usually pretty fun names for their beers. So. Yes, they do. All right, we're going to take a break, and we will be back. We have more whiskeys to taste, and we also have um, more beer. The next one is from Bear Bottle Brew Company in San Francisco, California. It's the Secret Path to Paradise IPA, (laughs) and uh, I'm looking forward to going. Uh, We'll be right back at Smoking and Toasting. It's all right. Your reaction was awesome. You're like, nope, that's enough of that. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome back, my friends. It's uh, Smoking and Toasting, show number 141, Exploring Canadian Whiskey with Dave Mitten, who is the global uh, brand ambassador from Corby Brands of Canadian Whiskey, which is, uh, we're finding a pretty cool thing to be. I uh, just just Absolutely. saying. Absolutely. Um, so yeah. So uh, during the break, those of you who were uh, with us on Facebook Live uh, may have caught it, but Adam, our producer, pointed out to us that uh, that Bud Light has a new uh, a new brand extension, and it it actually. I was expecting it to just sort of like get me going, but apparently it got Ian going even more so than so it got me going. This is this is um, tea. Lemon tea. It's Bud, Bud Light, Light lemon Bud Light tea. lemon tea, and it comes in three flavors. And you can get orange, lime, and l- lemon tea. Now and I got a couple questions. Orange, yeah. First off, do they have yeah. labels? Do they have ingredients on there? Well, I don't know. That seems to be a Bud Light that's thing for because Bud they, Light, they right? want to. They had the well, whole campaign. It's important to have <laughs> a sticker or or a printed box. But, but apparently, it's not important to list all your ingredients. Right, on right. It. You just have to put right. like some ingredients that people want to see. Right. Okay, so, so once we get past that, I got an idea, Bud Light. Why don't you make better beer? Why don't you just try making better beer instead instead of trying to glom on to all this bullshit that you keep doing? Right. Budweiser came out with what was that beer you surprised me with last week that had the was it last week? Uh, it was a couple of weeks ago. Terrible yes. Terrible aftertaste. What are you thinking? And then it was the Bud, a light Budweiser the, Reserve. A light. A friend of mine pointed out, he goes, well, maybe what they're doing is they're putting out what they call a craft beer so that Budweiser people will try it and be like, oh, craft beer sucks and we'll never go buy it. Well, that's an interesting idea. Now, seems like they're spending a lot of money to come up with something that convoluted. But, I mean, it's got to be something. Like, can't you just make a good beer? I mean, come on. You have the biggest facilities in the world. You have the most money. Right. You're, you're buying up craft beers because they're taking your, I don't know, Seven percent of your market share, or some ridiculous thing like that. You're terrified of that, and you can't just make a good beer. Like what the hell? It, yeah, you're absolutely right. If if you've got unlimited money and and uh, infrastructure, like like Budweiser would have, stands to reason you could hire if they haven't already the best brewmasters in the world. Oh, right. But but I got an idea. Yeah, I bet their brewmasters are good. Okay. Here's what I bet. I bet their brewmasters aren't allowed to do anything. Well, it, I bet that all of these ideas for all these different brews don't come from brewmasters. Mm-hmm. Those come from the bureaucracy, you see. Like, that has to come from all the pencil pushers. Right, right. Well, it, it's kind of like, in in the radio world, it's kind of like working for Clear Channel, or I Hurt Radio, as they are now uh, called. <laughs> uh, it, it's, a, it's not that there are no, there's no people with talent working there. It's that they're not allowed to actually use that talent That's in right. most cases That's right. to do anything unusual or unique or you, no, you gotta you gotta no. color by the numbers. You or hire else people with talent and then you completely stifle it. <laughs> yeah, it's, and sell your it's the homogenized product to everybody because it's for the many. Because you're, you're on as point. per your commercials, maybe your. Uh, drinkers aren't smart enough to try something that's not for the many. I, I don't know what you're going for. Yeah, it's like a bully what, campaign, what that to, old dilly dilly what, thing. What, what are We're you back to, to this me? again, aren't we? Well, yes, we are. Uh, uh, but I, I like when you get worked up. See, for for the first 130 shows, it was always me that got worked up, and lately it's been you. I I, I kind of like this oh, shift. Oh, Brian yeah. put up here. Uh, Wiki Brian put up here. It does have a label, by the way: rice, barley, cane sugar, natural flavored citric acid. Lemon peel, tea leaves, and hop extract. Mm. 
Interesting. That's an interesting way to hop your beer, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there there are some. Is that the yeah, third of the there triple some hop? That we'll no, use wait, that's the, another company. <laughs> there were there are, there are some though that will use the uh, you know the hop powder or the the extract as as a way to hop the beer. So it's not uh, well. I I'm it's just saying. You know what? I'm just thing. saying. Look, look. All this is BS. Like, why can't you just make a good beer? Right. Right. You know, I mean, seriously. They should have the ability to do that. And if you're buying one of those Bud Lights, and then you buy that little package of twang that comes right by the front counter, and right. you're putting in your beer, there's something wrong with your beer that it needs that. Mm. There are those who would say the same thing about salt on the uh, uh, rim of a uh, margarita. Well, I, some people like that. I don't, see, I never get salt on the rim of my margarita. Yeah. My wife gets extra salt. Whatever. It's, 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 it's just the... <laughs> but yes, you're right. If you're having to get a beer salt to put in your beer... Your beer doesn't taste good enough to begin with. It's, I'm with you. I'm we'll just with you. Add flavor to this. Those are probably the same people, by the way, that salt their food before they taste it. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to put that's, that out that's, there. That's well put. <laughs> I that's just want to well put, put that out there, right? <laughs> you get your food, you start pouring salt on it before you even taste it. Well, um, I think this would be a good time, Ian. To I've just offended almost everybody that listens to us. I think. Uh, what you th- you think we you think we're big with the Budweiser crowd? Is that what I'm thinking? Not. Yeah. I'm no, thinking, I mean the last statement. I, I, there. I'm thinking. Oh, oh, yeah. You know, I, I think the Budweiser crowd's probably pretty sick with me if, uh, they, if they listen. Would to you me. mind? I'm going to pop the top on this since we're talking beer here, and I'm going to hand it to you because you are Mr. Twirly Gig today. Uh, this is from Bare Bones Brewing in uh, San Francisco. It's called the Secret Path to Paradise IPA. And I will mention that Bare Bones is, um, they're a very uh, IPA-centric uh, uh, brewery. Not that they don't do other things, but they do a number of different IPAs. And they have a tendency to have a uh, a, a new, hazy, or juicy one come out every few months. Uh, so... Uh, this is one I was able this to get my hands it's, on. It's like discovering a tropical paradise of juicy, dank hops. Mm, that sounds like Let's it's see, got my name written all good. over it. Uh, if you'll take a look at that ing- uh, label, it's really got an ingredients label. Yeah, this is like got they're it. not messing around ingredients. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not even going to bother reading it. I'm just going to put it up to the camera. <laughs> yeah, and mm-hmm. let the let the camera focus on that for a minute because mm-hmm. that tells you everything ever. Yeah, not water, rice, barley, and hops. Hmm. <laughs> Actually, so it has yeah. It says vitals, water, grains, and hops, and then it has a whole list of everything going on. Of what kind here. of hops and what kind of uh, malt and yes. all kinds of yeah. Uh, it's very very uh, detailed. In fact, even the hops are. Uh, it's interesting. They break down the percentage of which hop they're using in uh, in in each thing. So uh, very that interesting. Is, that is lovely and geeky, by the way. Very interesting, yes. Beer geek information. Like, for sure. <laughs> like, at some point in time, if you really want the information, here's all of it. Right. And that's, but, that's okay. Yeah, they didn't they didn't mess around. They just went with it. It's, uh, it's, Thank it's you, a good It's a good way to go. This pour is looking very much like, um, like an orange juice, which... Uh, it really does. Yeah. yeah. Look, which Look how hazy that is. Has a lot of haze to it, and we're going to... Uh, uh, do a little taste and smelling. You remember when people would look at beers like Guinness and it'd be like, "Oh, it's so dark, you can't even see through it." Yeah, this is the opposite. It's so light, but there's no way to. But see But there's through no this. way to this see is... through it. It's like a, a cloud. <laughs> yeah. Opacity, as yes. they say. Yeah, nice. Well, um, so I'm I'm really uh, curious to see how we do on this because these guys have got a great reputation, Bear Bottle uh, Brewing Company, and it's uh, this is one of those beers. Oh. I can tell you. On the nose, this is one of those beers that I'm very likely to be sampling the nose and snort it right up my nostril because <laughs> I really love the uh, uh, the, the. You've smell actually done this. that quite a few times. I, I do it about every other show. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'll be going. Oh, this is really, you know. So, uh, but I love the uh, the nose on this. is fantastic. This is uh, about as crisp as a beer can finish. I think ever. Wow. Like this finish is super crispy. Uh, super citrusy. Like mm-hmm. my mouth is just watering right now yep. after that. What are you thinking? This would be my breakfast beer. This oh, this would be. I love it. It's got a um, it's got a, a, a like a grapefruitiness to it. It does. Like it, in the in the uh, kind of the soury bittery kind of thing going on that really finishes the orange juice ness because it really does taste a lot like orange juice too. It does. It's it, it. You can almost taste like. Four or five distinctly different fruits, most of them citrus, uh, in this. You can get a little bit of blood orange. You can get a little bit of a more 
uh, straight away kind of orange, the grapefruit like you mentioned, and I'm pulling pineapple too. You uh, know when you when you take that bit of orange peel and put it across your front teeth so you mm-hmm. look funny? It kinda, it's kind of like that. <laughs> for, for me, you know when you go camping, you might have had a few drinks the night before, you might sleep in a little bit in your tent the next day, it might be a little warm with the sun coming down, and you wake up and grab that beer from the cooler where all the ice is melted. This would be the perfect first beer of the day. <laughs> Doing will, that nice and refreshing. I will tell you, and it doesn't have that. I've got so much hops crammed into me that um, that I'm going to, you know, leave resin on your tongue, sort of feeling uh, that some IPAs can do. I'm going to tell you, this, this jumps instantly, instantly into my top ten and maybe my top. Five. This is well, this is a well crafted beer. I, I'm going to point something out to you that I think is a little funny. The mouthfeel on this is almost mimosa. Mm-hmm. It is. It is really You're right. Close I hadn't to thought that. of that. Yeah, it doesn't taste that way, but no, it has no, that mouthfeel. But feel. it has that same kind of. You know, mimosas are interesting because mm-hmm. they it's orange juice and and mm. uh, bubbles. champagne. So it's it, this then, has some of that, and the bubbles are very present in. I'm here. just wondering how I get more. This is delicious. That 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 does it for me right there. Yeah, I can drink this. This is this is good. That does it for me. Bear bottle uh, out of San Francisco, and. Um, I think, well, you you read the stuff about the beer. I think that's awesome. Yeah, I think it's just I'm absolutely for it. awesome. Yep. Um, I'm, Good I'm job, gonna, guys. I'm going to applaud as well. Now, uh, Dave, what else are we uh, going to taste here? Uh, uh, I think Canadian next we, we would go with the Gooderum and Warts. Okay, so and this is exciting. once again, Mr. Manuel Twirligig. Uh, if you would Mr. Twirligig is pouting because we don't have a camera for him right now. Right. So he is over here and he's looking a little sad. So I'll, you I'll are put him Mr. Up on the camera. So so you are Mr. Uh, Mr. Manuel Twirligig. Or today. I guess I guess I could. Now, oh, see, now you're getting fancy. Yeah. Now, hold on. <laughs> now, if you drop that bottle of whiskey, <laughs> you're gonna have uh, some very disappointed There's, show. Mr. Show co uh, conspirators here. Yes, well, there is that, right? <coughs> so, uh, Gooder Hem and Warts. What uh, what what kind of a whiskey is this? So other this, than Canadian, this is there's quite a story to this. This okay. is, and I, I will not tell the long version because God knows I can ramble. Um, the way Canadian whiskey was set up. Mm-hmm. I mean, the Scottish came over in the mid 1700s to start teaching us how to make whiskey. When the English were at war with America and lost in 1776, they made their way up to Canada afterwards mm-hmm. and started teaching us to make whiskey. <laughs> All the whiskey barons who set the rules and regulations in stone, uh, most of them came from the U.S., taking advantage of civil war or prohibition, or they came from overseas. Came from overseas. Interesting. That beer just got to me. Um, <laughs> now, Goodrum and Warts are two gentlemen that came from Suffolk, England. They came across the pond. Made their way to North America. They set up shop in the town of York, which is now downtown Toronto. Oh, okay. And these guys weren't whiskey makers. They were grain millers. They were the guys that you bring your corn, rye, wheat, and barley to. Make some flour. There you go. It's a good pop. You did a better job than I did. Um, And uh, they'd mill your grain. And back then, you weren't paying all cash. You'd kind of barter back some of the milled grain. These guys were so successful in what they did that it almost went against them. A lot of their grain rot would set in, rodents would get into it. They were said, throwing their profit away. Said more than they could deal yeah. with. Yeah, yeah. So they came up the idea, let's start making whiskey. They started making whiskey. They started building a distillery. They started making whiskey in a very different way than anyone was at the time that made their whiskey so successful that by the year 1869, this distillery in downtown Toronto was the largest distillery in the world. Wow. Producing more whiskey than any other distillery in the world in 1869. Gooderum and Warts. Gooderum and Warts, yep. Gooderum is how you say it. Uh, And I mean, they were, those two gentlemen were our first taxpayers in Canada. (laughs) Canada was a country for 50 years before we started paying taxes, and who do they go after for the first (laughs) taxpayers? They (laughs) They went after the whiskey makers. Yeah, of course they did. So the Canadian whiskey makers helped build our roads and highways. Yep. Uh, Gooderum himself, the family... uh, they were on our money at one point. They, uh, they the were mo- on the money. They I were on our money. This. Our most famous buildings in Toronto are Gooderum buildings that he built. Even the gentleman who does my job for Toronto locally is a young gentleman named Spencer Gooderham, seventh generation of the oh, family. Oh, wow. Wow. That's so, so interesting. what better ambassador to have working your whiskeys than a little Canadian royalty? Well, I love this on the nose to start with, Ian. Um, this is. Also, kind of unique. So today is all about we, unique. You know what makes mm-hmm. this unique? This is oh, tell me. 
you know what the majority you know what majority of Canadian whiskeys are made of? Corn. Corn. Majority mm-hmm. double column distilled corn with a little bit of rye. Mm-hmm. Even a lot of Canadian whiskeys don't have mm-hmm. rye. Mm-hmm. This is a four grain whiskey. Right. I saw that on the bottom. Mm-hmm. And it owed to Gooderman Wartz, where the grain millers used all of the different grains. Right. Our master blender, Dr. Don Livermore, decided to take it's four grains, seven distillates. So you literally get a little bit of the breadiness of the wheat. You totally do, yes. It's the yeah. first thing I get. You get a bit of nuttiness of the barley, certainly. You get that soft, creamy sweetness of the corn, and then you get that you get that spice. I that love heat this. Of the rye. That spice mm-hmm. and the heat. It's interesting how it goes across the tongue too, because like this has a little um, this has a little pinch of heat in the middle of it. And then it immediately goes away, and then comes back. And it comes and say, way back And I'm going to say yes. it: a warm whiskey hug. Oh yep. yes, yes. I, I love when you say that. Actually, I, I always tell I a story. I, I there was this uh, lovely little woman I was doing a By show. By the way, in he's Montreal. caressing I'm the very bottle. Happy. I, I don't. Getting, I don't know. Was, he was just. He was just stroking it. It was gently actually like dripping. Was, but you're right. Oh, okay. I was. I was. <laughs> it did look like I was caressing it. I was like, he's okay, like, he likes this whiskey. I wouldn't put that villain with the cat. Yes, exactly. I wouldn't put that past me, really. I was tasting this when it was brand new it's only been out a few years and there's this little woman the grandmother's age very sweet and we had a whiskey show in montreal and she wanted to try this and she said i'd love to try a different unique whiskey i don't drink whiskey a lot and she has this one and right away she starts like patting her chest i'm like oh my god she's gonna take the big (laughs) one and she goes she's like it reminds me of my husband's like scotches what is that the warmth and I was like, oh, it's, it's like it's really hot going down. Mm-hmm. Like, there's a heat. She goes, yeah. I'm, she goes, what is that? And I said, that's that's your soul being healed. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's a sign of a really, <laughs> really good, and this is really good whiskey. In a uh, in a nutshell, this is why you want to have Canadians on the show. So, soul because, reparation yes, is a huge yeah. part it, it, of the whiskey, it, yes. right? <laughs> it, it, because they're the Canadians will look at the world this way. I mean, for God's sake, they had the whiskey makers on their money. I mean, what does that tell you? And we It'd still a, should. Can you imagine? A, in if American currency instead of being you know Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Jackson it was like you know Jack Daniels and uh, <laughs> Elijah uh, Craig you, Elijah Craig and exactly <laughs> I'd 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 vote for that yeah you I'd probably should uh, can you imagine trying to get that pushed through Congress <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we want to put Elijah Craig on the ten dollar bill <laughs> oh, I would so vote for whoever that would be um, well, well this Jim, is Jim Beam goes on a one th- this yeah. is ex- yes. this yeah. is also exciting because this has only been sold in Canada for the last four years. It is now officially in warehouses in the U.S. Mm. and will be on shelves. I think it's on shelves in some states. What's the, uh, what's the ABV on that? That's to be very cheeky, 44.4. That's ABV. what it says right here, 44.4. Grain whiskey. Of course. Wow. wow. So that worked out well. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is something that you said it's only about four years old. This, like, on the market, about four years market, old. The yeah. whiskey itself. Right, not the whiskey, but the... the pro- y- you said it perfectly. We don't have an age statement on this one mm-hmm. because the rye and the corn on this are probably 10 years plus, mm-hmm. but the wheat and the barley's not. Right. Probably so, only so about you, four or five years. Right, so, so you'd have to say four or five. Yeah, and, but majority is about a 10-year yeah. whiskey in there, actually. <laughs> that, that makes some sense. Yeah. So what was, what was on shelves in Canada uh, from Gooderm and Wartz before this came out? Well, like I say, they started producing whiskeys in 1832. Right. And we're, the Goodman Wurtz Distillery is quite fascinating. I mean, Prohibition essentially shut it down. As pro, American Prohibition really killed Canadian whiskey. But Canada obviously wasn't going through Prohibition, but it was Not just... Not at that the, time. There just wasn't uh, the ability to our, legally import it to the our, U.S. Our best customer wasn't buying from us. <laughs> no. Now, how some what some distilleries did is you can find bottles of let's say old overholt rye very mm-hmm. famous american mm-hmm. rye uh, uh a gentleman in, in brooklyn showed me last year and i found a few bottles since during the prohibition days old overholt rye was made in the gooderman wartz distillery ah, in downtown toronto i love it <laughs> it's so, so good many many whiskeys like that i mean it's and that's the way it goes today our distillery hiram walker and sons in, in windsor it is it's been there since 1857. It is a large factory. Uh, by case volume, we're the largest distillery in North America. We put out about five to six million cases of spirit a year. Wow. That is not all ours. Sure. We put out probably 70 to 75% of all Canadian whiskey on the market. 
we put out a lot of different American whiskeys. That's where blended Canadian whiskeys come from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We make a lot of stuff for you guys in the U.S. I mean, we make gins, we make vodkas, we make rums, we make Malibu for North America. I was going to say, yes, Malibu. I we, saw we, on your on your product we, sheet, we, I was we, like, we okay. We make some pretty crazy stuff. Yeah, uh, that's that's a... Obviously, that's a big seller in the summertime months because yeah. uh, you see you see it just mm-hmm. absolutely everywhere. It's like we've um, got a little craft area, but I mean, it is a big business. You know, mm-hmm. a lot mm-hmm. we make a lot of spirits for a lot of different brands. It's um, it's got to be interesting too, if you are making that high a percentage of the Canadian whiskey that's that's sold in the United States. It's like, is that is that a good thing uh, for the consumer? You think or I mean, does it does it sort of let you do sort of whatever you want, and and well, this will this will, uh, this will filter down, and people that are looking for Canadian whiskey will buy it. To be uh, clear, like if we make someone else's brand of Canadian mm-hmm. whiskey, it's their recipe from their master blender. We make it to their. It's not like we're creating it for them. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as brands of, it's, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, one of the first things I noticed with this job is came into the U.S. And I think it was California or here in Texas. And mm-hmm. I went into a store and I looked around, and Canadian whiskey section. I said, there's about 35 brands of Canadian whiskey I've never heard of in my life. Wow. And you're from Canada. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, <laughs> most of the Canadian whiskeys I see in the U.S. are not sold in Canada. I mean, not your Crown Royals, your Gibsons, your Forty Creeks. Those are right. obviously sold in Canada. But there are some... The liter and a half bottles for seven ninety nine. They wouldn't get away with selling that in Canada. So, I don't yeah. know who's selling that stuff. I don't know. <laughs> well, this reminds <laughs> me of uh, if you uh, if you talk to anyone from Australia, they'll tell you no one in Australia drinks Fosters. Mm-mm. No, but but because of a very successful ad campaign, Americans became you know convinced that Fosters was Australian for beer, yeah. and and that's how we. That's how we perceived it to be, but the reality is, <laughs> if you go over there, like you can't sell a Fosters in Australia. Here's the straight up truth with Canadian whiskey. You kind of brought it up in the beginning. Canadian whiskey, whiskey's rules and regulations. Mm-hmm. For instance, we have two categories of Canadian whiskey. America has 52 categories of whiskey. Right. Canada has Canadian whiskey and flavored Canadian whiskey. Wow. So a flavored Canadian whiskey is like when you see a whiskey that's got apple flavor or peach right, flavor right, or, right, you know, course, that's yeah. what it is. And that has to be a minimum four-year-old grain whiskey, probably corn, aged for four years in a wooden cask, and they add whatever the flavor, flavor is. is. Mm-hmm. Pretty simple. 40 ABV, usually or under. To be a Canadian whiskey where there's only one category, the rules are simple. You have to be international law cereal grain corn, rye, wheat, or barley, like most whiskey Mm -hmm. countries. You have to be fermented in Canada. You have to be distilled in Canada. You have to be aged in Canada. And it's got to be bottled a minimum of 40 ABV. Interesting. Now, with that, you have the ability to essentially, like, talking about these liter and a half bottles for $7.99 on shelves. Mm Mm-hmm. If you just want to put out a, a light base whiskey and age oh, it for it, three years can, in an ex bourbon cask and put it in a bottle, you can. You can meet all those requirements and still not Reborn. really make a great whiskey. Yeah. But the one thing Canadian whiskey producers have not taken advantage of until the last couple of decades is you also have the ability to be the most innovative whiskey category in the world. Mm. Because Je- there because are not that, 50 categories that you're, you you're not to being into. restricted to certain right. things. Like, I mean, we all love scotch and bourbon, obviously, and, but, and those are about the strictest laws mm-hmm, there are. Mm-hmm. And everyone has to do it that certain way. Japanese whiskey, the most loose, their laws are so much more loose than Canadian whiskey, but they're putting out incredible putting out great stuff. Yes, they things because yes, they're they taking are. advantage of what they can do. So, for instance, one of our rules is we have to be minimum three years old in a small wooden cask. Mm -hmm. So with that, sure, you can take a small wooden cask that's been used over and over and over and over and age some whiskey for three years and put it out, and that's fine. Or you can do, like, things we're doing. You can take brand new oak. You can take Hungarian oak, French oak. You can finish in rum. You can finish in space side casks. You can finish in port casks. You can do so many interesting things. Same as our distillation. We call them distill. We double call them distill. We call them in pot distill. We pot distill. You can bring out and take away so many different flavors from it, the cuts. On, yeah, yeah, I love it. All right. So you guys just, you know, 
I'm, gonna, I'm waving the flag. Keep going. Get industrious. Like, what is keep, a, keep experimenting. That's awesome. What is this one going to go for when it hits the shelves? That one is going to be in the mid-40s. Mid-40s. Due okay. to the government shutdown, if you mm-hmm. remember that, at the beginning of the year, this was a little bit slower getting into the U.S. market. Okay, so okay. it took a little while to get into the market, but mid-40s. And when can we expect to see this? This Is, uh, is it on some shelves now in the U.S.? In Austin, yes. In Austin, Austin, Austin yes. Specifically, and they'll be shipped out to Houston, Dallas, San Antonio. Um, hopefully by the end of June. So okay. Yeah. So, so uh, across the next couple of weeks, then you should be able to find this at least in in Texas. So I'm excited uh, for this one. I've been carrying a bottle around in my backpack for the last year, tasting with bartenders and whiskey geeks around. I the do country. that a lot just for myself. Just yeah. Yeah. But and I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> this is the one. Like I was saying earlier, with the Pike Creek Lake rum and cognac, people are going nuts over it. Mm-hmm. The bourbon. Freaks the bourbon crowd likes are this, going yes. over this one because it's, it's heavy corn, lots of rye. You got the wheat mm-hmm. and barley in there. The bourbon heads are mm-hmm. going mm-hmm. for this one. All right. Well, when we come back, we're going to take the step toward rye, and rye's a pretty big deal in Canadian whiskey, yeah. correct? Yeah, it's absolutely. A, it's our uh, uh, it's our backbone. It's, it's your backbone. It's, it's what All flavors right. our whiskey. All right. So we will uh, do a little sampling of that coming up in our next segment, and we uh, sure appreciate you being on, Dave. This is a, this is a lot of fun. I'm loving it. Thank uh, you good. for having me. Awesome. Good. We'll uh, we'll continue to taste here, and one more uh, beer to taste as well will be on the way. That's the Stone City Brewing, or the I'm sorry, the Smog City Brewing Infinite Wishes Bourbon Barrel Aged Imperial Stout. Looking forward to that. We'll be right back. I'm so excited for this whiskey to hit shelves and to see oh, what we're going to do with great. it. This one's pretty good. Fantastic. On the beach in Hawaii. Welcome back. It is Smoking and Toasting, and we are bringing you show number 141. This show is all about craft beer, fine spirits, and hand rolled cigars. And we're brought to you by B&B Butchers and Restaurant, 1814 Washington Ave in Houston, and the shops at Clear Fork in Fort Worth. Also by BB Italia and BB Lemon. And uh, BB Lemon growing soon with a second location uh, about to open in, mm-hmm. in Houston. So excited about that. From Thrillist, which is if you wind up getting on their email list, it's it's kind of annoying because you're like, stop sending me emails. Oh wait, I want to read this one, uh, and it's it's one of those things like you you want to like unsubscribe, but then right as you're going to do that, you go, oh, I'm interested in this article. Uh, so from Thrillist, uh, 21 beers that you need to try or you need to be drinking. It's actually what the title says. Uh, this summer they start with Left Hand Brewing's Flamingo Dreams, and I have not had this, but it's mm, a berry it. a berry blonde ale and. And I do love um, uh, Left Hand. They they have great stuff, and they are generally available in uh, in Texas. So you can mm-hmm. uh, you can find them in if you're looking for from Houston. Spindle Tap makes the list. Mm, We've had them they? on the show before. Yeah. with their five percent tint. It's an IPA at five percent. So this is one of the you know that new more trend that we're seeing right? of, of very much more sessionable and uh, easier to drink uh, IPAs for the summer. Another one of those is from Oceanside, New York. Barrier Lomax. Isn't Lomax, isn't that a Dr. Seuss character? That's Lorax. Lorax, I'm sorry, I got that wrong, yes. Uh, uh, McKellar San Diego Raspberry Blush made the list, as did Second Shift Technical Ecstasy. Uh, It's a Czech Pilsner, but it comes out of St. Louis, uh, proving that it's not just the big bad bud in St. Louis. There's some cool craft going on there There's as well. Actual beer. Uh, Fifth Hammer Fire and Rainbows is an IPA with oats and lactose. Uh, comes in at 8%. It's from New York, New York. Uh, the Hit- Hitachino Nest Yuzu Lager uh, at 5.5%. Yes, it's a fruited lager. I will point out, we tried their IPA and both of us could not stand it. I don't know if you remember. It was a Japanese IPA, oh, do I do you remember recall? that, yeah. Had the little thing. Yeah, we were, n- we were not fans. But yet I see this beer showing up in more and more like trendy bars and stuff. It seems to, not that I'm a trendy bar guy, but you know what I mean. Uh, it seems to be showing up in uh, in interesting places. Ruben's Brews from Seattle, Washington. Uh, summer IPA at 6.5%. New Belgium Brewing's The Hemperer. Uh, this is the I've one seen that. I haven't the, tried that. Well, now, I, and I have, and I have to say... I, I while I love the smell of it, I didn't like the taste of it very mm. much. It just wasn't. I just wasn't looking for that cannabis taste in my beer. Right. Right. You know, it was like, it was very aromatic and fragrant in a very pleasurable and positive way, 
but it just it wasn't to my palate for didn't the translate yeah. to the flavor. Did, that was, but that could be just me. Uh, Maui Brewing's Coconut Hiwa Porter. Uh, so it's not just light beers, uh, lighter beers on this list. Mm-hmm. Uh, although porters aren't necessarily that uh, that big. In fact, it's an, an American porter. It comes in at only six percent. I've had so, that. Uh, yeah, it uh, it looks delicious. Uh, the Green Bench Saison de Banc Vert uh, from Saint Petersburg, Florida. Uh, easier to drink than to say. Uh, the Bayern, uh, the Bayern Saint Wilbur Weizen. They're from Missoula, Montana, and the Night Shift Whirlpool. From Everett, Massachusetts, to pale ale that comes in at four and a half percent, a pale ale. Wow, that's actually yeah. That that's the shift we're seeing mm-hmm. in the summer beers is being able to come in at these lower ABVs and and still be crafty and tasty and interesting. Well, people want and, to be able to go to the park and mm-hmm. and session beers all day without you know being forty five degrees by the time we're trying to leave. P. Frem Nectarine Golden Ale at six point nine percent out of Hood River, Oregon. Uh, Rothaus Pilsner uh, out of uh, Germany is 5.1%. Cross Strain Hellas Creek from La Vista, Nebraska. Uh, 21st Amendment El Sully from San Francisco. Stillwater Inseto Dry Hopped Sour with Italian Plum at 5% from Stratford, Connecticut. As you can tell, we haven't heard of a lot of these. And, right. and we spent a lot of time drinking and, and searching for beer. Researching. Yeah. Research, uh, yes. Boulevard uh, Tequila Barrel Lime Goza from Sam uh, from St. Louis, Missouri. Highland Park Lazy Susan Peach Sour from Los Angeles, California. And I saved this one for last because this may be the coolest brewery name that we've come across in, in, um, uh, in, in a few weeks, uh, especially if you're still in junior high school. The name of the brewery is Hoof Hearted. Hoof, H O O F, Hearted. H E A R T E D. And the beer is called Are We Having Fun Yet? It's an American Pale <laughs> Ale at 6%, but it's Hoof Hearted. <laughs> and so there you go. That's, you know, every now and then I'm still in junior high school. It just, <laughs> that stuff will just, uh, will Farts just work still for me. Funny. So. Yeah, they, they always have been, actually. George Carlin had a great routine on that. Farts are fun. Farts are funny. Uh, all right, so uh, what do you want to taste first, Ian? I'm going to let you make the call on this. Do you want to go with the lot number 40 Canadian rye whiskey, or should we go right to the bourbon barrel-aged imperial stout called Infinite Wishes? Well, I feel like uh, if, if it's an imperial-aged stout, let's go whiskey first. All right, whiskey it is. Uh, this is the lot number forty, and so we're we're back to you, sir. Tell us, uh, tell us what. We, first of all, that's a beautiful bottle. It's it's uh, really gorgeous. You want to show that to Mister uh, Whirly Gig Thingamajig there? <coughs> it's a very tall one. You may be taking your life I'm in your hands this. because if this whiskey were to like fall and break, that would not be a good thing. Don't try this at home, everybody. Yeah, yeah. So there, nice there's so much I'm, young I'm history to this whiskey. There's like it's. Young isn't always a good, you know, term to associate yeah. with whiskey, right? No, but I mean, there's. You'll understand when I get into it. It's um, as we started off our conversations talking about me going to travel the world and bartending in the mm-hmm. late '90s, right? So, one thing I did learn: you were asking me about trends back then, whether it was Sydney, Australia, Los Angeles, you name it, London. One thing in common in the late '90s in the bar scene was. Your cocktails were coming in glasses shaped like this. Oh yes, yes. They were really neon trendy, colored. They really were trendy, juicy, sort of fruity, the, yeah, electric, uh-huh. mm-hmm. vodka, cosmos, sex in the city uh, ruled right. the airwaves. Yes, Everybody yes. wanted to have a cosmopolitan. Mm-hmm. Um, and you could get those little uh, lights that you would break and put in there and mm-hmm. exact light up your drink. Yeah. In the Canadian whiskey world back then, it was very popular. Even in the U.S. before 2012, Canadian whiskey was the number one selling whiskey spirits and 2012 bourbon took over so consumption of canadian whiskey in the 90s was quite heavy especially in canada obviously Mm -hmm. and sold in 160 countries around the world Mm -hmm. but not still not well respected necessarily in the whiskey category but people were consuming it Mm -hmm. now imagine our master blender in the 90s says hey got this idea I'm going to, uh, I'd like to put out that rye that we blend into our Canadian whiskey. I'd like to do an expression of 100% rye grain. 
What do you think happens when we put out 100% rye grain in the late 90s? Nothing. Well, I would imagine people didn't really know what rye to do with it. Rye wasn't even right? a yeah. thing at and that like, point. People right. did not know what to do with it right. in Canada, Europe, or the U.S. It failed so miserably. Well, this is one thing. It, if you remember Dave Pickerel, when he was on, talked about this, that if anything, his success was sort of guessing and anticipating that Rye was going to make the huge comeback mm-hmm. that it did. And when, when it did, he was kind of in the right place at the right time with a good product, and boom, yeah. it, it, it took off. But you're right. This would have been well before that resurgence. Well before that. Yeah. Now, where this did change after that, because it was one of those things that didn't work, we decided let's not make this. They took it off the shelves. They stopped producing it. They used the Rye to blend into all of our Canadian whiskey blends, but not put on its own. Makes sense, at you know, given yep. given where the market yep. was, right? Fast forward, early two thousands, New York and London, UK start bartenders start bringing back classic cocktails, brown mm-hmm. boozy stirred drinks, bourbon, rice. bourbon yeah, explodes yeah, yeah. around the world, Irish whiskey makes a comeback, Japanese whiskey, Sex in the City is replaced with Don Draper and all the and guys Mad on Men, Mad sure, Men, and yeah. every every guy in a suit and tie wants an old fashioned and, fashion and a martini yeah, yeah. at lunch, whether Absolutely. they know what it is. Right. <laughs> and as a bartender or bar owner, you could make any menu you want, but if your customers aren't going to order it to eat or drink, mm-hmm. you're shit out of luck. So when the consumer starts wanting these brown, boozy, stirred cocktails, bartender's a little ahead of the curb at that point. Mm-hmm. You know, bourbon's exploding. The rye movement. Someone at Corby Spirit and Wine says, hey, remember that 100% rye that failed so miserably a decade ago? We should try it again. Why don't we try it again? Yeah. And our master blender, Don Livermore, said, I'd like to take a crack at it. He was brand new as our master blender. He had worked at the distillery for years, but he had just come back from Harriet Watt and had his PhD in brewing and distilling. Nice. Very smart man. Uh, he said, I'm going to take 100% unmalted rye. I'm going to pot distill, or I'm going to call him distill it. I'm going to pot distill it afterwards, discard of the heads and the tails, which essentially you're getting rid of the uh, the green grass and soapy characteristics. Mm, mm -hmm, mm. And you're just leaving the rye notes, the cinnamon, the clove, the baking spice, the the citrus, the floral, and he puts it into brand new virgin oak. And now you've got this beautiful rye whiskey that's been mellowed and rounded out vanilla toffee caramel flavors from the new oak. It's not so much of a punch to the face, which I like about Summer mm-hmm. Rise. Mm-hmm. It's more of a love slap. And everyone loves a love slap. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's so good. We put this whiskey out in 2012. And you know what happens that year? It wins Canadian Whiskey of the Year. Wow. Nice. nice. Yeah. And the rye, people's palates are going towards rye. Right. People's thing, things are beginning to swing back around. It's, it's Absolutely. fortunately won that accolade a couple times. Uh, got Best Rye at the World Whiskey Awards two years ago. It's, this is why I'm here. This is what I was selling. This is the whiskey that bartenders around the world right now for Canadian whiskey are grasping mm-hmm. to and they're putting mm-hmm. on their cocktail menus and back bars. This is this is what keeps me going. Interesting that it this is. This is uh, so incredibly smooth, yeah. by the way. This is, uh, this is crafted with- in small batches. Lot 40 is Canadian rye whiskey in its simplest form. Mm-hmm. And that's it. I you love know. it. I'll tell salespeople, they're like, well, what should I say? I'm like, 100% rye, pot mm-hmm. distilled, new oak. New oak, yeah. Anyone that knows anything about whiskey will get it right away. And that new oak adds a little uh, stringency to the aftertaste that's really nice. Yeah. And, I, and I just love the sort of cinnamon note that yeah. you get right around the middle. It's just wonderful. Well, and I mean, obviously, this is great. You want to make an old-fashioned or a Manhattan, any classic cocktails. Yeah. But it's mm-hmm. elegant enough that if you want to mix it with some sherries or citrus and make a l- more lively, zesty, refreshing summer mm-hmm. cocktail. Mm-hmm. But it's also great to have with a beer. And normally, if I'm going to have an American whiskey to sip on, it'll be a bourbon generally. Right. Not so much a rye. Mm-hmm. Rye is not something you normally sip yeah. on. Right. I, but I this is, it. This right. is <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> but this is, this is a great rye to sip on as well. Mm-hmm. I'm also thinking, and I've thought this about all three of these whiskeys, that this would pair well with a number of the cigars in my humidor. Oh, yeah. You know? I'm thinking of the A.J. Fernandez, uh, the H. Upman by A.J. Fernandez uh, with this. It's got such complexity in that medium-bodied thing, but I don't think either would cancel out the other. I think they would, would... You know what I pick up 
every time I go to the uh, cigar shop is one of those Southern Draw Cedrus. Oh, you love that, that cigar, and it's quite good, and it would go right. great with this. You're absolutely right. But he said it would go with beer, and I'm I'm saying prove it. You've mm-hmm. got you've got that. Uh, oh well. Uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I mean, and actually, hint, hint, he's, he's calling I'll, me out. Actually, I'm going to hand this over to you because, as as you can see, it is quite the wax covered uh, uh, bottle top. This is our um, uh, this is our <laughs> imperial stout. You have your bottle opener. Uh, I do. I have it right here. Don't you want to show but it's it first? Not, it's not a. Uh, uh, it's not a, uh, a, a pointy tipped one. So. I'm the professional. Here. Yeah. <laughs> now, now do, again, you do this at your own risk, Ian, because that is the only bottle of Infinity Wishes or Infinite Wishes that I have. But, uh, but it is. It's okay. It's a, a porter. It'll bounce. <laughs> Actually, it's a bourbon barrel aged imperial stout. Oh, sorry, it's a stout. It'll still yes, bounce. It'll still bounce, and it will, uh, it will no doubt be delicious. Now, uh, I don't. I hope you've got some whiskey still left. Some of this rye. Plenty in the bottle. Uh, okay. Yeah, there's, there's a whole <laughs> bottle of it here. I'm all pretty right, sure. All right. all right. Well, you're going to have to do the honors there, and I will. You can either do that and pass it over can... here, or I will uh, pass the cups to you, one or the other. Oh, so you're going straight through the wax with the? Yeah, uh-huh. I don't think it's going to work. Okay. Uh, I thought maybe. I know you're you're always handy with you know having the the sharp instrument nearby. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm really curious to see how an imperial stout, which is going to come at a whole other, you know, uh, flavor profile is going to uh, mesh with uh, with this rye, which I'll tell you, on, on its own is just fantastic. Oh, that's good. By the key to the, the key to the sound effect, by the way, is to let the cap drop on the table, <laughs> but you amplified it by letting the bottle open. <laughs> I missed the cap, so it I used the bottle the table. It was a two-bouncer. I'm still, I'm it, still it, it going worked. for, it worked, for yes. authentic sound. Yeah, I like it. I like it. Yeah, because we, we have carpeting in this room, so uh, we're not going to get much uh, sound off of the floor. So, All right. And, uh, Ian, remember, we're pouring several of these now. This so. is pouring out like... Uh, like a uh, fizzy coffee here. Mm-hmm. This is, uh, this is right a away. very interesting. Torrance, California is uh, where this is from, by the way. So um, it's where this uh, stout is, is from. And it just looks interesting to me. And I, I recall reading reading the bottle and, and appreciating what was there. But, Ian, maybe you can refresh us with what it says on oh, the bottle. Oh, let's see. About this here. Infinite Wishes Bourbon Barrel Aged Imperial Stout. Infinite Wishes is inspired is an inspired reimagination of a classic Imperial Stout, uh, decadently aged for twelve months in bourbon barrels. Infinite Wishes draws from the depths of nothingness <laughs> and pours obsidian black with intense aromas of vanilla, cinnamon, and cooked sugar, finishing with the layered richness of a bourbon chocolate pie. Wow. Well, it's interesting because the first thing I get on the nose is actually, and now that you said bourbon chocolate pie, it was kind of like ding, ding, ding. My brain like gets that. But if, the first thing I was getting was that sort of date and raisin and dried fruit mm-hmm. thing that so many bourbon barrel aged uh, stouts have you know, seemed even stronger on the nose on this one. So on the nose you get that, and you will get that <laughs> right at the very beginning of the first sip, but then it immediately turns into chocolate and mocha, like. Just like oh, you're that. so right. Yeah, you're so right. And I now totally get that. What would it call it? A bourbon chocolate pie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which and it's is a wonderful too. I love this bourbon yeah. chocolate pie. What, there's nothing I, about I wanna, that I don't like. It's a perfect description yeah. <laughs> for this. I, I want to pet the bottle. Oh, good. It's it's good that you're doing that. I think that's uh, <laughs> I think that's really important. Do I have to save some of this for Johnny this, after show? Uh yeah, you probably do. This uh, I think is delicious. a this I, I think is a 2019 uh, limited release from. Um, uh, from the brewery, from it, uh, not Infinite Wishes. I'm sorry, from uh, Smog City, and it's interesting because Torrance, if I remember my California geography correctly, Torrance is close to like City of Industry and uh, you know Riverside, that that Inland Empire part of Los Angeles that uh, is not the sexy part. Let's just say it's the it's where the industry and stuff is. So they call this Smog City, which I think is uh, is perfect, but. Uh, uh, Dave, I see you're. I see you're I, about I'm, to pair. I'm going to do some mixology here. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're going to actually mix. Mm, oh, in the mouth mixing, mm-hmm, not mm-hmm. instant boiler maker, mm-hmm, right there. Mm-hmm. Rich rye with the, the chocolate bourbon notes. I have to tell you, they do go well together. They really, really do. They well, do all seriousness. I love going from the stout to the rye. 
That works really well. Um, I will tell you this, that I find in general, too, rye whiskeys, and if you're uh, not hip on this, but with medium-bodied IPAs, rye whiskeys mm-hmm. go fantastic. Yeah, there's something about the the, sun, yeah, those yeah, flavors. the way those flavors uh, combine that, that really so works. So if you go into a bar with, that, working with, with this. that rye whiskey, pair it with a uh, two-hearted ale, mm-hmm. that would be fantastic. Bell's two-hearted. Mm-hmm. That's, a great, that's a great beer. I have been noticing that in U.S. certainly and parts of U.K. and a little bit of Germany where even cocktail bars are putting together Boilermaker menus. And yeah, They're yeah. doing the nice beer list, and it's not always whiskey. It might be a mezcal, but they're doing different spirits to go with beers right. if you don't want to come I and just, have a cocktail. I'll tell you what. I feel like this is a golden age for spirits. Now, And, and it, it strikes me as really weird when I see articles that say that uh, that consumption of alcohol overall is down slightly, and and uh, c- because it is such a wonderful time to be a fan of, you name it, whiskey, rum, tequila. There's so many amazing things happening. Craft beer? Are you kidding me? Like it's yeah. never been a better time to be mm. a fan of beer right. than it is right now. And yet it, it just seems like. I don't know. People always romanticize being born like back in the olden days. Give me right now. I'll take right now because all of the you stuff that I love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All the stuff that I love is happening uh, is happening right now, and it's and it's really just really tremendous. Now, the Canadian whiskey. How is is it on the rise in the U.S.? I mean, I, I think generally all whiskey is on the rise right now. I think it all is. Someone, it's funny you ask, someone, I don't have statistics or a piece of paper in front of me to prove it, mm-hmm. but talking to some of the heads of the companies and the bosses that like look into all the numbers, uh, we were in some meetings last week and someone brought it up. We were talking about our, our fiscal is July 1st, so we start our new year mm-hmm. every July 1st. And there. Everyone's excited for next year because... Apparently, Canadian whiskey is on such a rise in the U.S. alone right now that a lot of brands are, like, trying to get some plans to strike and get out there. And we've been here for a few years, and noticing the difference in sales Mm -hmm. has been incredible. I mean, working with companies like Hoadling & Co., who's been, uh, you know, former anchor uh, distillery or brewery, uh, taking care of these brands have been incredible. Like, getting it into back shelves of bars... And it's it's been fantastic. I think raising general awareness that not all Canadian whiskey is blended whiskey that you just keep in your freezer, right? I think makes a yep. big difference too. And I and I'm guessing in in many ways that's the sort of central part of your job is My, to educate people about how much really great well crafted whiskey comes out of Canada and why it's not a category that people. Should ignore if they're if they're fans of of the spirit. You Absolutely, know? and I mean, as an ex bartender, spirit geek, everyone knows me. I don't sugarcoat, mm-hmm. and uh, I tell it like it is. I'd like to say that every brand of Canadian whiskey is starting to get innovative. A lot of brands are, and there's some incredible <coughs> stuff coming out, right. and that's what we need. We need every brand, not just mm-hmm. ours. Mm-hmm. We sure. need everyone to raise the category. Oh, it, it totally raises the bar for everybody. Uh, and it's, I would say, you know, John Hall gets credit, the man who came up with Forty Creek in the '90s, of being one of the first innovators. Um, Don Livermore, our master blender mm-hmm. right now, he's certainly getting credit. Mm-hmm. Uh, for being one of the more innovative whiskey makers in Canada. And there's quite a few other people that are starting to follow suit. Um, again, people are changing their ways of things, but it's whiskey, sure. so it takes a little while. Mm-hmm. Like, if uh, there's co- there's m- many micro distilleries opening up right now across Canada, putting out some great vodkas and gins, as we all know, and I know they're laying down some whiskeys, because I know these people personally, but... We probably won't see this stuff for another five, six years. Right, because of so the it's like, It is yeah, coming. You can't put it's out coming. Aged whiskey if you started this year. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So it's coming, and that's where we're kind of a little ahead of the game. Those one point six million right, barrels. Right, right. We got some cool stuff happening. We're working with amazing people in the U.S. But yeah, simply put, five years ago coming to the U.S., I would go back home with my head a little low. Yeah. And think like, oh, it's not even. I'm not even seeing my brands, let alone any Canadian whiskey in back bars, but. I said this yesterday, and it's it's probably comes off as a little cocky or arrogant, but it's it's like I've been fortunate in my career that like I get to be 
one of the many judges on things like 50 best bars in the world and the spirit mm -hmm. awards and tales mm -hmm. of the cocktail and does that, thrillist call you for these lists th th they have yeah. not yet <laughs> probably wouldn't want me but the, the 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 cheeky part is when the lists finally come out now mm -hmm. like i'll look at the world's top 50 and go and it's kind of smirk and go oh Lot forties on their cocktail list. Yeah, lot lot forties on, on their, their list. list. Oh, it's yep, on yep, their yep. back bar, and I'm like, totally. This is where I was like, oh, five no, years ago, I couldn't great, yeah. sell it into anyone, but now some of the top bars in the world have it on their cocktail menus. So, last question about the industry here. Um, this, we we see, you know, the statistics and and the stories that obviously Canadian whiskey is on the rise in the U.S. Bourbon is on the rise. All whiskey is on the rise. Gin, tequila, all on the rise. Craft beer is on the rise. So who's losing on the store shelves? Because you guys can't all be on the rise, yeah. moving more product than you were moving a year or two ago without without there being a give and, and take somewhere. Where where's the where's the slack being taken up? Can you is that something you it's it's a great question because, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking now. I'm like, oh, is man, it, I was out the it, other day and I saw many more vodkas on a yeah, shelf. And I saw. Right. Oh, yeah. The vodkas too. Well, someone, so someone told me the other day there is now over, <laughs> it's over 6,000. No, sorry. It's over 7,000 brands of gin are for sale right now. Wow. On planet Earth. Wow. So I, like, I wonder what that just, number was 10 insane. years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so uh, just give you a, uh, a perfect example. Right here in Houston, 8th Wonder Brewing. Which is a very good, very well respected craft brewery. If you're a beer spirit wine store of any note, you've got to have their lines in there. There's something people come in mm -hmm. looking for, asking for. They've now uh, opened a distillery. They're putting out their own uh, vodka, their I, own I gin. I have a bottle of their hop gin. Yeah. So they're going to be coming in and going, hey, we want shelf space. And they can't. you can't say no to these guys. Because their beer is so important, so they're going to wind up getting shelf space. It's like something has to give. Yeah. Well, is it the cheaper spirits like the like we were talking about the I you know the would hope seven dollar so. uh, bottles? bottles. And so, yeah, I would hope so. I mean, if you want to get into like sales talk, that you could. I mean, anyone can see this. You can walk into a spirit store. I was at one in uh, Dallas yesterday. And you go in, and it was a Canadian whiskey section. And mm -hmm. Obviously, I don't ever speak of other brands, but there were a couple brands where you're like, oh, my God, they're taking up three shelves with one skew, like one type right. of whiskey. One whiskey, yeah. And it's like, you know, and then I got mine. I'm like, oh, there's one little row. And, you know, and that's mm -hmm. what it is. You're the little guy. You're growing. But it's like, I'm assuming when something comes in, they take away one of those because yeah. it takes up so much Well, space. we have seen that happen with beer. If you go to a Spex yeah. today, like the one where I shop down in uh, uh, Midtown, um, and you're looking for Budweiser or Bud Light, that is now a much smaller section of the uh, cooler yeah. than it used to be. It still represents a pretty big amount of yeah. retail space compared to other but you know they've made a pretty serious commitment to craft beer and that stretches cooler 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 and then maybe there's two coolers at the end where you find the you know bud and miller and and coors and 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 that it's, type of it's thing. funny in the stores that are a little more dedicated to craft products though that when you go like if you go into those stores even your downtown specs and stuff where is the budweiser and all the macro brews located they're the farthest corner, mm -hmm. and it's the last few, and they're all yeah. kind of jumbled together in there. I'd like to say it's because that's what they're the least proud of. It's the same concept as if I'm scanning the aisle for tequila, I don't spend a whole lot of time looking on the bottom shelf. Right. Because I know what's down there is going to be the more, you know. Plastic the, bottles. The plastic bottles. <laughs> the well tequila, so to speak. And that's, Which is that's innovative, not what I'm Because if you for. drop those plastic bottles, they don't generally break. Right. You would think they would be on the higher shelves. but <laughs> <laughs> It would make more sense. What? But I, I, I was just going to say, I guess that's the same concept with the beer. It's like it's like show off with, with your interesting and cool and sexy brands. Right. And, uh, and if you want Budweiser, it's in the back Yeah, corner. it's, it's yeah. over there. You know where it is. Yeah. It's for the mini. Yeah. Well, there's one thing I've noticed that you're saying now that we're in this subject, but it's like specifically in the Canadian whiskey category. In the last five years, certainly people are educating themselves more on Canadian whiskey, becoming more aware, becoming more aware of like whiskeys that are made in Canada, but bottled in, let's say, different countries like right, the U.S. Right. and sold, where 
certain spirit stores you go to are taking those American whiskeys and they're putting them in the Canadian whiskey section. Because if hmm. the label on the back says distilled and aged in Canada, Canada right. but bottled in the U.S., and you so know, I often of wonder. It as a Canadian whiskey. I often wonder it. how those brand owners feel about that. If it was, well, you know, I will say it probably depends on what the whiskey is and where it comes from. If it's a Texas whiskey, I imagine they're not too happy about it because there's such a a, a mystique, yeah. uh, you know, applied to being a Texas whiskey. Right. Same thing for a Kentucky or a Tennessee. Mm-hmm. But it, I guess, if you were from, you know, Oregon, maybe it's not. Yep. And as some big are. A deal. I've obviously looked at some of their websites, and some of them are very open, being like, "Oh yeah, we're, we we buy whiskey from Canada and we bottle it in this and put well, it in." And like, yeah, fair enough. You know, we not all a, do, obviously. We have a guy, yeah. a, a friend of ours, been on the show, the uh, the Tater Wade, Talk whiskey um, es- expert Wade, uh, and I love his philosophy. He's like, it doesn't matter. Matter, just be transparent about it. Just just let people know where it actually comes from. If it's good, it's good. It doesn't matter how it was mixed or 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 where it came from. But don't try to say you're X if you're really Y. Right. Yeah. You know, and that's that. I think is a good. Well, that's. I think. Philosophy. I think his 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 philosophy is, is when you have a company that's trying to sell it off as a Kentucky or a Texas or something that isn't where it's from. Then you're taking advantage of your customer at that point, right? Right, and you're not and so, being you're not being completely. And honest. so I, you know, with what you just said, I agree. I think if it's made in Canada and they want to put it on the Canadian whiskey shelf, I think that's fair enough. And by the way, one one of the best beers I've had on the show today was made in literally the grossest part of California that exists, <laughs> uh, and that was this uh, it's, Imperial it's water. from Torrance. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. This beer gets like every time I go back to it. It's even more delicious than it was. The you know, last the only time. thing that beer is missing is some chunks. Uh, see, that's <laughs> where you lose me. That's where you had me right up until chunks. Uh, uh, that's like me saying to you, you know, all it needs is a little more, a little more, a little hops, more hops in the right? IPA. Yeah, so. uh, Dave Mitten from uh, Corby Brands. Corby is is uh, obviously a, a huge collection of brands. But you deal primarily with Canadian whiskeys and and with uh, and with being an ambassador for them, which I think is just an absolutely cool job. I um, I appreciate our neighbors to the north. They're the ones we're not trying to uh, build a wall to keep out. So uh, although not yet, uh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> although back when Alan Thicke was alive, maybe we should have you know you know done something to keep him from coming and going quite so if often. If you don't mind, I'm gonna have myself just oh, a little more. Oh, I, I, I think you should. But uh, anyway, thank you so much for being thank on the show and much. for uh, and for pleasure. educating us about Canadian whiskeys. Because I have thank to you. I have to be honest. There was a lot of this stuff I really did not know, and it's it's been fascinating to learn more and more about it and to. I know this might seem a little corny, but but to be able to taste the craftsmanship that's going into uh, these three whiskeys that we had uh, today. I mean, these would go toe-to-toe with pretty much anything that's in my bar in their price thank range, you, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, very very much so. So uh, so thank you for being on the show, and we'd love to have you come back anytime. And, uh, anytime. And, and do, uh, do more tasting with us. We appreciate it. Ian, any final thoughts or closing words? Uh, well, frankly... Uh, I, Canadian whiskey is just one of those uh, one of those subjects where a lot of people think of just a few brands. Right, Forty Creek has been on the front of actually making Canadian whiskey uh, a real whiskey instead mm-hmm. of just a blended whatever. Absolutely. And um, and I think it's interesting to have so much craftsmanship coming out here and having having the awareness of it. That's awesome. Yeah, and it's been fun to help uh, spread that a little bit. Absolutely. It certainly has. Uh, thank thanks you, again, thank Dave. You, gents. Thank you, guys, for uh, uh, tuning in for show number 141. I am excited about where we are headed uh, next because Backfish Brewery is going to be on the show next week. That's going to be awesome. Yeah, so we've uh, had their beers on here before. They're a huge factor uh, in the uh, Houston craft beer scene and in the Texas craft beer scene. And uh, it's going to be really fun to have them on, and I hope they bring something really unusual and interesting. Uh, so uh, we're looking forward to that. That's going to be next week's show. Uh, thanks to our sponsor, B&B Butchers and Restaurant. Thanks to uh, Adam on the Wheels of Steel. And uh, thank you to everybody who came along for show number 141. It's smoking and Toasting. We'll see you again next week, and uh, I'm going to use the ride. Cheers. 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 Mm. Well, dude, thank you very much. That was...
A lot of fun and very informative.